As Sean said, my name is Devin. I am the lead butterfly and insect keeper here at Henry Dorley Zoo. Um, I am going to give you a brief overview of kind of our involvement, the like history of this project, um, the protocols and how we rear the tiger beetle and um, the surrogate species that kind of shaped those efforts and a magical YouTube video that changed the course of history forever. Um, you heard that right. There is a magical YouTube video. Um, I will be sharing that with you today as well. So to get started, I'm just gonna briefly kind of touch on this. Um, I know that there are maybe some people that don't um, know insects as much as others. So tiger beetles um, are, there's about 2,600 species worldwide. They're an indicator species, meaning if their population isn't doing well, um, neither is the environment that they're living in. They are predatory throughout most of their life. So they're predatory as a larva and in the adult stage. They're extremely, extremely fast. Um, they're fossorial for most of their life as well, meaning they're living underground. Um, and they're sexually dimorphic, which um, sort of makes our job easier, although it's really, really difficult to sex them. Um, so to sex them, we have to look at the front portion of their legs here. And there are these little tiny hairs there that um, distinguish a male from a female. Um, we have a specialized um, kind of box that we put them into with black lining on it. And sometimes it makes those hairs pop really well for us so we can tell them apart. Sometimes it doesn't. Um, so uh, it's, it's a, a delicate process for us. Um, the life cycle, really quick, just gonna go over that. Um, they are true to style for beetles. They go through the four life stages, which is egg, larva, pupa, and adult. Um, we here at Henry Dorley Zoo will see all of those stages. We just don't see it all at once. So typically their life cycle will take about one to two years, kind of depending. Um, and you guys can kind of see the breakdown of how many days that goes through in order to get them to the full adult. Um, so we'll talk about the project history a little bit here. So in 2010, Omaha was approached by US Fish and Wildlife um, about kind of taking on the challenge of trying to produce the Salt Creek tiger beetles. In 2011, that was our first attempt. Um, we produced 30, uh, or we produced 27 larvae, and we had brought in 30 adults, so 15 males and 15 me uh, females, which gave us the 27 larvae, but only 11 survived over the winter diapause. Um, in 2012, on our second attempt, only two larvae were produced and both um, died in diapause. So this is when we kind of started some official talks on how do we improve this process because clearly something wasn't working. So um, we conducted a series of experiments with Cisandella tagata globiculus. I feel like I'm slaughtering that Latin. Um, but we set up this series of experiments where we tested kind of preferred soil composition, um, which salinity ranges yielded the best volume of larva, um, the appropriate amount of water to put in each dish, um, and really ways to reduce cannibalism. So once we kind of figured that out, we were stuck with this, how do we reduce cannibalism? And that is where this magical video comes in, which I will show you later in the PowerPoint. Um, some other dates of note. In 2014, um, this is when we kept back adults to make sure that 
the animals that we were producing in captivity could actually produce another generation. Um, in 2015, this is when we did our first adult release. Prior to that, we were doing larva releases. In 2019, we added a new partner with Topeka Zoo. And then in 2020, we released on a newly restored site with no current population. So to break down this process that we have here um, at Henry Dorley Zoo, as I said, um, this is kind of a year long process for us. So even if we aren't doing any of these five stages, we are um, prepping for the following year of breeding season. So we have like an adult collection and enclosure time. We have captive breeding, fishing, larva setup and care, and then reintroduction. So the first is this adult collection where um, we, we can go out into the environment to actually collect pears. Um, in the past, we've done this, but we have kind of shied away from this in recent years. So we wanted to make sure that the adults we were producing weren't sterile. Um, so we have been using our captive bred ones to breed new populations or new larva. Um, but also the wild numbers were a little dicey for a while, so we didn't want to risk pulling any more adults away from the habitat um, and the natural population. And now really the only time that we pull adults is if our captive red populations are a little skewed, meaning that sometimes we um, get way more females than males or vice versa. Um, and we also kind of value all of the genetic data. So we wanna make sure that every line kind of remains intact. So sometimes we'll have to pull a wild um, adult in order to kind of breed that genetic data. So once we um, get pairs, we set up what we call an oviposition box, which is just a super fancy bug term for um, like laying eggs and breeding. Um, and we kind of assemble those like this. So in this picture A, this is kind of what we start with. This is um, a Petri dish that we wrap in cellophane. Um, the cellophane is to help us remove the soil at the end of this process um, and kind of keeping that square intact so we can continue to kind of look for larva. Most of the time they're completely fish, but every once in a while we'll get like one larva that's still in there and we wanna make sure that we get everybody out. Um, then we add soil kind of in this process over here in B. So we'll start with some soil. We introduce the saline water and then we top it off with more soil. Um, we do add a 0.5 and 0.354 molarity. Um, when we were doing the initial study with Tagata, there wasn't really a significant difference between either one of these molarities. So we use both and let um, the Salt Creek tiger beetles choose where they wanna lay their eggs. Um, then the Petri dishes end up in the oviposition box just like this. And then we'll end up introducing a male and a female to each of those boxes. So once we have those introduced, um, we do give them like food daily. We usually give them wax worms, fruit flies, pinheads. We've now started using um, like mealworms and black soldier fly larva. Um, so they get a really good variety of things. Um, we kind of record any observed breeding activity that we see. Um, one of the kind of traits of tiger beetles is they do a mate guarding position, which is um, if you think back to the first slide, you saw the male with the female um, and that, that's a mate guarding position. Um, and within this oviposition box, we let the male and the female remain together for about five days. 
Um, we will then pull the male and allow the female to remain in the breeding box for an additional five days. So she can lay eggs um, kind of un, un um, bothered by the male. Um, and then we will sometimes release those animals back into the wild, but oftentimes they're just set into another breeding box um, to then be paired with another male or female. So this is where things start to get interesting and where we're gonna talk about this magical YouTube video. Um, so one of the other issues that we were running into is that we were having cannibalism and we didn't know how to get uh, larva out of those Petri dishes without crushing eggs, crushing larva, disturbing the soil, things like that. So we found this magical video. So I'm gonna stop sharing this screen and go to an additional screen with this video so you guys can see. That is this one here. So this um, is a video that we found online. Um, and this is kind of what we could consider fishing. We've adapted this process a little bit to suit us better, but this is kind of what spurred this for us. You guys can see that this guy has some ants on a string and he's trying to use that to pull the larva out of the hole. Um, this is not a Salt Creek tiger beetle larva. This is just a tiger beetle. Um, you guys can kind of see, it's really interesting that this is how he kind of goes about something like that. So he does successfully pull one out eventually. But this is really what um, spurred this for us and kind of worked the best for us um, to kind of manage that cannibalism issue. Let's see, I'm trying to get my video to move forward, there we go. Um, so you can see in this picture here that there are several larva holes in here and they're all squished together and they all burrow and they make long burrows as well. And it's really difficult and it was really difficult for us to kind of figure out a way to pull that out. So that video really helped us. Um, our larva numbers absolutely just skyrocketed after we um, kind of perfected this technique for us. So we do it a little bit differently um, and we do not add any like bait, I guess you would call that to the end of a string. We actually just um, go ahead and take a string like you can see down here and we just wiggle it in that hole and they will grab on and we can pull them out and then place them in an individual container. So we mitigate any of the cannibalism that you're seeing. In this previous slide though, you can see those burrows, how long they are and how they wander throughout the Petri dish. So if they come across another burrow, they'll sometimes find another larva and they'll eat their brothers and sisters, which we definitely do not want. So once we have the larva out, we can set them up in individual um, containers. This was kind of our old setup where we had tubes. Um, they were kind of cumbersome, but they also limited the amount of larva that we could produce because of the space within the Percival. So you can see here that we only have one rack of larva within this Percival. So we actually moved to something different. We moved to this here, which are just what I would call like a sauce cup. Like we get these from the Treetops restaurant and that's what they use to hold like ketchup and ranch dressing and stuff like that. Um, so that's what we use for our larva. So as they are um, set up in their own individual um, container, we give them the 50-50 sandless mix, which is something that we um, make ourselves. We use that in our oviposition containers. 
Um, and it's something that we kind of put together when we were doing those initial experiments with Tagata. That's what we found that they preferred to lay in was this 50-50 sandless mix. Um, we add a label to the cup with a specific code on it that lets us know um, who this individual is. So as you can see here as an example, this is gonna be male number one, female A. This would be the first larva pulled from that specific ova position box and then the year. So that way later on down the road when we're doing another um, breeding, we can kind of specify the genetic data. I know that there is like some debate as to whether or not um, you know, insect genetic, genetic data really matters, but we do keep track of it here. Um, we then go ahead and put a lid on that sauce cup and some of the larvae are held here, but we also have other partners that take larvae and help us raise them. So that's Lincoln Children's Zoo, Topeka Zoo, and University of Nebraska Lincoln. Um, it, really, really helps us a lot because we can then focus on kind of the, you know, breeding and the ova positions and things like that. But also it's kind of an insurance colony for us. So knock on wood, if this building were to catch on fire, we aren't the only institution that has a colony of these Salt Creek tiger beetles. So as I said before, they're housed in this um, Percival, which we use to mimic kind of what's happening out in their natural habitat. So we can set temperatures, we can set light cycles, and that um, gives them a good indication of when they need to actually go into um, winter diapause. It gives them an indication of when to wake up in the spring. Um, we essentially want this population to close or emerge as adults as the same population would out in um, the wild. So um, to give you kind of a timeline of how this process works for us, we kind of start in the spring when the um, adult population comes out in the wild. We want our population to come out as well. Um, that's usually kind of at the end of May, beginning of June. Then we'll set up over position boxes um, and give them those 10 days to kind of breed and lay. And then we'll start seeing larvae at the end of June, beginning of July, all the way until mid July, end of July. And then that's when we start the really heavy feeding process to get them um, bulked up into winter. We really want them into their um, L3 larva stage. So they go through the three stages. Um, they Two go minutes. through three, thank you. Three stages as larva. You can kind of see how we do their feeding here where we give them three prey items, four prey items and six prey items. They get fruit flies and pinheads. And then right now is the time that we're starting to cool the Percival and start to get them into that overwintering process. And then um, it starts all over again in the spring. So then this last kind of step would be the reintroduction. Um, in the past when we've had the tubes, it's been um, kind of a whole day affair because we have to crack those tubes open. But with the sauce cups, it's been much, much easier because we're able to kind of break it down the day before that we go out into the environment. Um, so we'll just leave a little bit of soil um, in those sauce cups, kind of put all the sauce cups into a cooler and then bring them out into the environment to reintroduce them. Um, so here is just a couple more pictures of the reintroduction. We've kind of changed this process over the years as well. Um, now we kind of use like a string method where we just set kind of a vector and pop them into holes along that vector. And then I'm going to leave you with this last little video. Don't blink because it happens so quick. But that's a little larva being fed. 
he's getting fruit flies and he clearly was hungry because he just took that fruit fly right off the paintbrush. <laughs> 